and thank you for joining me. In this lesson, I share an in-depth explanation of how I created this painting. I also provide some general tips that you can use in any painting. When I was planning this painting, I had a specific vision to focus on the beauty of light over an ocean. I also wanted to paint a complex, cloudy sky that had interesting light, and I wanted my lighthouse to complement the colors of the sky. I found reference pictures to help me transfer my vision onto canvas. I used different elements from these pictures, along with a few of my own ideas, to help plan pleasing compositions in my sketches. Sketching is the time when I try to nail down my composition, or how everything is arranged in my painting. There are many general composition guides to help during this step. I use the rule of thirds to place my main focal point, which was the sun and the light on the water. I then plan some other key points of interest to complement that focal point. These included the lighthouse, the wave, and the details on the beach. I planned where I was going to place these key elements by sketching them in different ways, with the goal of having them complement each other while also not drawing attention away from my main focal point. The colors I used for this painting are titanium white, cadmium yellow, both medium and light, cadmium orange, cerulean blue, phthalo blue, prussian blue, dioxazine purple, radiant purple, quinacridone magenta, and chromatic black. Later, I added some burnt sienna and van dyke brown for my rocks and cliffs. To have color harmony in my paintings, I mix the light colors from the first pile that I mixed of that color. For example, I began by mixing cadmium yellow light and medium with some titanium white to create a light yellow mixture for my sun. I took half of that mixture and added some cadmium orange to darken it. Then repeated this step to mix my light orange color. I used the same process to mix my pinks, blues, greens, browns, and grays. In general, I usually mix three shades of every color that I will use when painting. This way, I will have the basic starting colors for my highlights, midtones, and shadows. As I'm painting, I mix more shades of colors from these premixed piles when I need them. To darken a color, I will usually add a bit of black or the complement of that color. Adding the complement will result in making the color both darker and less saturated. To lighten the color, I will add white or a lighter color. For example, yellow will lighten orange and green, while pink will lighten purple. I used a small flat brush to begin blocking in the sky with a pale yellow color for the sunlight. I worked outward from there with the same brush, shifting slowly from the pale yellow to some darker yellows to light oranges and pinks. Blended each color into the next with a round blender brush. Next, I applied some pure titanium white to the center of the sunlight with a clean flat brush and blended outwards from there. Adding the pure titanium white helped lighten the area and blend the colors into each other. I used the same small flat brush to begin blocking in some of the clouds, applying the paint in small circle motions and then blending with the corner of a large flat brush to soften edges and get rid of brush marks. I always wipe off my brush with a paper towel if I am moving from a dark to a light color. This keeps the light colors from becoming muddied. For this large blue area, I used my largest one and a half inch flat brush and applied the paint in loose X motions. From there, I blended from side to side. Applying the paint in this way ensures that it blends evenly onto the canvas. And using this larger brush is a huge time saver when blocking in a large area like this. 
However, I used a smaller flat brush when blocking in the blue around the lighthouse so that I could have more control of the brush marks. These clouds on the right are more horizontal and flat than the fluffy clouds on the left. So instead of applying the paint in small circle motions, I used a slight side-to-side -side motions, switching between a dagger striper brush and the one and a half inch flat brush. I used the dagger striper brush when I needed to make smaller marks on the clouds. I used a round blender brush to blend and soften the clouds, but I kept my motions from side to side. These large blue and purple clouds are much darker than the other clouds because they are further away from the light. With a dagger striper brush, I added some yellow and orange sky colors in a few areas near the horizon to break up some of the clouds. With the same brush, I began adding highlights to the bottoms of clouds that were facing the sun, all the while blending the colors onto the canvas with a clean blender brush. I lighten the sun again by applying some white directly into the center and blending outward. To get this nice crisp edge on the bottom of this cloud, I used the flat end of a dagger striper brush. I began with the pink midtone color of the cloud and then went back through with the dark purple shadow color. I used a round mop brush to create this fluffy shape on the top of the cloud. My reference picture really helped me with the placement of the shadows and highlights. I blocked in these blue clouds at the top by swirling the corner of my one and a half inch flat brush in small random circles being sure not to cover up all of the light blue sky. I wiped off the brush with a paper towel and used it to blend the clouds from side to side. I used this grayish purple color to paint subtle highlights on the clouds with a small mop brush. I placed the highlights wherever the sunlight might hit, but kept it subtle because these clouds are much further from the light source. I lightened the sky color behind this cloud so that it would pop away from the background and make the sharp edges easier to see. I was unhappy with the position of this cloud. It was too low in the sky and it needed some pink color behind it. Rather than fiddle around with it, I painted over the entire cloud with a pink color and waited for the paint to dry so I could redo it later. I often choose to paint over something when I need to make a big change. It saves me time and it keeps me from becoming frustrated. I used a round blender brush to add some more blue clouds to the top right of the canvas. I made these clouds darker than the clouds on the left because they are farther from the sun and I thought it added a nice color contrast to the sky. The light blue sky color had dried, so I added some more light blue to blend the clouds into. Blending into the light blue helped soften the clouds and make them look more cohesive. This large purple mass of blocked in cloud shapes needed some more detail and definition to break up the individual clouds. I began by adding some blue with a dagger striper brush to define the shadow of this cloud. Then worked my way down, adding highlights and shadows to define the shapes of the rest of the clouds. I blocked in the outline of this large cloud with the dagger striper brush. I used the lightest pink color of this cloud so that it would become the highlight. Inside the outline, I blended a darker pink to provide a mid-tone color. Then I used my reference picture to add the purple shadows in the correct places. 
Lastly, I added some yellow sparingly onto the cloud in places where the sunlight would be hitting the most. This happened to be around the edges. I made some final adjustments to finish off the sky. To make the sunlight more effective, I backlit the purple cloud again with a liner brush. I used some titanium white mixed with a small amount of cadmium yellow. I also added more highlights on the clouds closest to the sun. Lastly, I painted the colors of the sky between these two clouds to add some definition to the bottom edge of the top cloud and make it pop out more from the background. When I finished the sky, I decided to block in the rest of the painting to quickly get rid of the white canvas and to get a better idea of what the painting would look like when it was finished. The goal was to block in the big shapes of the painting and worry about the details later. However, I wanted to get the colors and values of the shapes as close to where I wanted them to be in the end. This distant landmass was blocked in with a purplish gray color because objects in the distance will lean towards the color of the sky. I used a small flat brush to outline the top edge of the cliff because it creates nice flat edges. Since I already had it out and ready, I used it to block in the rest of the cliff. I switched to a darker gray for the cliff face not in sunlight and changed my brush strokes from horizontal to vertical to show the form of the steep cliff. Often, the direction you move the brush will show the way the land is formed. I used the dark blue color from the sky to begin blocking in the ocean. For this back area on the horizon, right up until my large focal wave, I simply applied the blue with a flat brush, keeping my brush marks horizontal and flat. When I got to the trough of the wave behind the large wave, I switched from the horizontal motions to a downward sweeping motion to remind myself of where to paint water movements when I began detailing. Since I already had the blue ocean color on my brush, I began blocking in the areas of this large wave that would be blue. The area in front of the wave is horizontal up until the face of the wave begins to curve up. I needed some blue on the wave face to create a smooth transition of colors. I also blocked in this downward swoop of the wave crest before I changed my colors. I used a smaller flat brush to begin painting the barrel of this wave. I wanted a light turquoise color on areas of the wave that light was shining through because yellow light shining through a blue wave will look green. I used a darker turquoise color in the trough of the wave to transition from the light turquoise to the blue and blended those colors together with a blender brush. Lastly, I blocked in the spray of the wave with its darkest value, the shadow color. Applying the paint in small circles with a small flat brush. I used two different shades of brown to block in the rocks and cliffs so that I could plan a basic idea of where my shadows and highlights would be and also distinguish where the different rock forms began and where they stopped. Because of atmospheric perspective, colors will get darker and more saturated the closer they are to the foreground. For this reason, I painted the closer sections of the cliffs darker than the sections behind it. I used a small flat brush while blocking in these rocks and cliffs. I filled in this section with a gray color because I wanted to fill this area with some gray rocks when I came back through with some details. I blocked in the sand with a lighter brown that I used on the cliffs and filled in a darker brown area near the waterline to represent some wet sand. I used a flat brush and kept my brush strokes horizontal.
My goal when blocking in the lighthouse was to get all of the individual parts of the lighthouse painted and to keep the edges as crisp and straight as possible. Since this is a man-made object, there is little room for organic movement. A weirdly slanted or uneven line can make the lighthouse appear warped and will become distracting to the viewer. Using either a flat brush or the side of a palette knife helped me with painting the straight lines. The left side of the lighthouse was painted pink to reflect light coming from the sunset, while the right side was painted gray for shadow. I blended these colors together with a clean flat brush to create soft transition of colors. When blocking in the grass, I was able to see the edges of the cliffs more clearly and took the opportunity to adjust the shape of them by switching between the brown and the green paint. Once the block-in was dry, I began my detailing, starting with the lighthouse. I used a liner brush to paint the back edge of the roof. To create an effective glowing light, I like to focus on the colors around the light. To begin painting that glowing light, I painted the inside top of the roof orange to reflect the light that would be coming from the lighthouse lamp. To make these thin lines with the palette knife, the paint needs to be loaded evenly along the edge. To do this, I spread the paint out as thin and flat as I can on my palette, and then scrape the edge of my knife one time through the paint. To apply the paint, I lightly but firmly press the edge of the knife onto the canvas one time before wiping off the knife and reloading for the next line. I added some dark orange highlights on the roof to indicate light shining on those areas. Oftentimes when painting, adding highlights and shadows in the correct areas is enough to give a flat looking object the appearance of being three dimensional. Adding a shadow under this railing helps inform the viewer that it sticks out away from the edge of the lighthouse. To create the impression of individual bricks, I staggered horizontal strokes with a small flat brush. I used darker colors for the bricks on the shadow side of the lighthouse. I laid the paint thickly, almost impasto style, to add a texture and roughness to the bricks. To add some interest, I painted some of the bricks red as if the white paint had peeled off from weathering. To add more definition to the top of this roof, I cleaned up the edges, brightened highlights, and darkened the shadows. I painted these red bricks in the same way as the bricks on the tower, except my horizontal strokes followed the angles of the house. This helped keep the bricks in perspective with the house. I used a flat brush to straighten and clean up the edges of the siding of the door. To add some detail to the door, I blocked it in with a light brown color and then used a liner brush with some darker browns to paint a wood grain texture. I painted the sunrise on this distant landmass by first adding a darker yellow on the top edge of the land under the sun to represent light that would be cast from the wraiths. Then I lightened the sun at the top edge until it appeared to merge with the sun. I angled the sun rays out from the center of the sun and gently blended them from side to side. This pink color back here was me trying to figure out how to paint sunlight reflecting on the distant water. I was not happy with it, so I left it to dry and moved on to my mid-wave. When painting the mid-wave, I primarily used a dagger striper brush for detailing and a mop brush for blending. I used the tip of the dagger striper brush to paint the spray line of the wave. 
The water directly under the crest is darker because the crest creates a shadow on the wave. I highlighted the water on the crest of the wave by painting the dark color first, then lightly painted strokes of highlight color, starting at the top of the crest and worked my way downward, following the movement of the water. I added a light pink highlight color onto both the top of the foam line and parts of the trough of the wave directly under the sun, because the sunlight would be brightest in this area. For the same reason, I painted a slight green color on the face of the wave under the sun. I chose green once again because yellow sunlight shining through blue water will make green. I used a dagger striper brush to paint these thin lines that represent the spray or foam lines of the waves. Waves should become smaller and closer together as they recede out into the distance. To add some definition, I painted a shadow under the crest of each wave using a dark blue color. Just like the foam line of the waves, the shadows on the waves get steadily smaller and lighter in value the closer they are to the horizon. I wanted to create a more subtle reflective glow of this sunlight, so I painted blue waves over the pink section of water. Lighter colors, placed on top of the correct darker colors, will create a nice glowing effect. The colors should be painted in a sort of prismatic shift, which simply means to follow the orders of colors in a rainbow. To create this glow, I began with areas of pink where light would hit the top of each wave. Then I painted smaller lines of orange on top of the pink and finished with even smaller pale yellow lines on top of the orange to represent the brightest sparkles. I apologize for the fuzzy focus in these sections. I almost scrapped the video entirely, but thought having some fuzzy footage would be better than no video at all. This experience taught me to double check the focus on my camera every time I hit that record button. I added this area of bright sunlight on the top of the crest by first painting a small line of pale yellow across the top edge. Then I pulled the paint down gently with a fan brush to blend it in with the wet blue paint on the crest. I painted the highlights on the spray of this wave using a small, old, frayed flat brush. I tapped the paint into the canvas with the tips of the frayed bristles, which created perfect water spray marks. I love the effect of leaving the top highlights of the spray thick and crisp, but I blend the bottom of the spray until soft, just barely touching the canvas while making small circular motions with my round blender brush. An easy way to add extra detail to the wave spray is to paint small water droplets coming off the top of the spray. I use thin down paint on the tip of my liner brush to create these droplets. Thinning the paint with a small amount of paint thinner allows the paint to come off the brush easier and creates smaller marks. This turquoise on the wave represents the light shining through the barrel. I really smushed the paint into the canvas before blending it out with a round blender brush to smooth it out. The color should be lightest in the top center of the barrel and should slowly become darker out from that point until it shifts to the primary color of the wave. There should also be a dark area of shadow at the bottom of the barrel directly under the crest. The face of the wave looks more natural when it's painted with a variety of different shades of color. This is because there will be areas in the wave where the water is thinner or thicker and the amount of light seen through these areas will change. 
I created this effect by painting lines of lighter and darker blues next to each other and blending them with a blender brush. Keeping my brush strokes always in the direction I want the water to be moving. In general, the wave face will be darker at the bottom because there is less light shining there. Water in the ocean moves in two directions, horizontally and vertically. These foamy water lines that represent the movement of the wave receding from the shore move in a horizontal direction. I painted the lines with the tip of a flat brush using horizontal squiggly motions. The lines become thicker and farther apart the closer they are to the shore. I decided to paint the shallow water on the shore with the reflected colors of the sky since this water is more still and glassy than the rest of the ocean. I began by blocking in the area with a light pink color and then building on top of that by blending orange under the sun and purple along the edges, mirroring my colors from the sky. Inside the orange area, I layered from darker yellows near the edge to a light yellow of the sun's reflection in the center. I kept my brush strokes horizontal and blended the colors together to create a seamless transition of colors. I let that area dry so I could add some crisp details on top of it later. I created the details and shapes of these glyphs by adding the highlight and shadow colors on top of my already painted mid-tone color. Each stroke of highlight creates the front edge of a ledge or a rock form, while the shadow creates crevices and the undersides of rocks. To create the look of jagged cliffs or rocks, I do not blend any of the colors together. This keeps the edges between colors sharp and crisp. It can also be helpful to use the edge of a palette knife to apply the paint in some areas. As I move closer to the foreground, I allow the paint to become thicker and more impasto-like. This thicker paint creates bumpy ridges on the canvas that makes the cliff look more detailed and appear closer to the viewer. the grass, foliage, and pathways on top of these cliffs to look wild and natural, not like a garden somebody planted in their yard. For this reason, I was careful not to paint the plants in any obvious patterns. To show some distance, I painted the plants larger, more detailed, and more colorful the closer they got to the viewer. I used some general guidelines when painting this pathway. One was to have the path get steadily wider as it got closer to the viewer. Similarly, the rocks on this path became steadily larger. On the sides of the path facing away from the viewer, parts of the grass and bushes overlapped and obscured the edge of the path. This helped create the illusion that the path is behind the grass. I painted the side facing away from the viewer slightly darker on the edge to help make the path appear flat. I used a mop brush to tap on some green color that would show through under the grass and plants and also represent areas of short, sparse grass. I painted these areas of dirt and rocks to help give that wild, natural look I was going for. I used a round filbert brush to paint the more rounded bushes. I painted the shape of the bushes first, then added some highlights. When painting grass, I like to thin out my paint a little with some paint thinner to allow the paint to come off the brush easier. I start painting the grass with the tips of a comb brush and finish with a liner brush. The comb brush works great to paint smaller blades of grass without too much effort 
because you can paint multiple blades of grass at the same time. I use the liner brush when I need to paint larger blades of grass. I paint these larger blades from the bottom to the top and lessen the pressure on my way up to create a tapered tip. To create smooth, more rounded rocks like these, the colors are blended together so that there are no distinct edges. I used a rounded filbert brush to paint the gray highlighted edge of each rock. Then I painted the brown midtone color underneath that, saving the dark gray color shadow for last. I blended each color into the next to create the smooth rounded look of the rocks. I started with the most far away rocks so that as I moved forward, the rocks would appear to be in front of the ones I painted first. Painting the grass and foliage in between the rocks helped to incorporate the rocks with the rest of the scene. Reflections should be darker than the original subject and should be distorted by any moving water. I create the distortion by gently blending the reflection from side to side. Then I add some water movement lines on top of the reflection with a liner brush. I darkened and extended the wet sand by tapping on a darker brown color in horizontal motions with a flat brush. Tapping the paint on rather than using brush strokes created a nice texture to the sand. To create the reflection of this foam line, I painted a slightly darker foam line directly underneath it and then blended it with a blender brush to distort the reflection. These clumps of foam have both reflections and shadows. The reflection of the foam is an inverted shape painted slightly darker. Painting a line of shadow under the foam separates it from the reflection and creates a more three-dimensional look. With a liner brush and some thinned down paint, I lighten some of these water movement and foam lines to introduce lighter highlights on the water. I use the same brush to apply small dots of highlights on top of the foam line and clumps of foam. To wrap up the water details, I use the tip of my old frayed flat brush to tap some water splashes onto the backs of these rocks. I used some thinned down light blue paint with my liner brush to paint these squiggly lines to represent water flowing over the rocks. I started detailing the sand by tapping some darker brown paint over the lighter brown blocking color using the tips of a comb brush. This added some random looking rough texture and shadows to the sand. To paint small rocks, I use a dark brown color and paint the shape of the rock where I want it. Then I add a highlight, usually a lighter brown, on the side facing the light. This defines the edge of the rock and is an easy way to add some detail. I used a liner brush to add small pebbles on the beach by painting scattered, small, light brown and dark brown oval shapes. I avoided painting any patterns to make the pebbles appear naturally placed. These larger rocks on the beach were painted very much like the cliffs. I began by painting the shape of the rock in its mid-tone color, then I added highlights to define the edges facing the sun and darker brown to define the bottom of each rock. Lastly, I painted the shadow that the rocks would cast onto the beach. I began painting this tree trunk by outlining its shape. I formed the shape of the tree trunk in such a way that when the viewer looks at it, it sort of leads the eye back to the focal point. 
Creating areas in your painting that point towards your focal point is a neat composition trick to keep the viewer's eyes exploring and lingering inside the painting. I relied on my reference picture to paint the lighter and darker brown colors of this log. To settle the log into the sand, I painted some of the sand color over the bottom areas and added its shadow. Painting an object's shadow prevents that object from appearing like it's floating. Moving the shadow right up next to the bottom, shifted the perception of the log, causing it to appear resting on the ground. As I was working on the shoreline, I realized that there were too many little rocks and it made the shoreline look busy. My final step with any painting is to check for any last easy improvements or details I can add. Mostly, the painting needed more shadows and highlights. I improved the shadows on the lighthouse by glazing a darker color over the areas that needed a more pronounced shadow. A glaze is a thin layer of translucent paint applied over a more opaque area. Applying the paint this way allows the previous layer of paint to be visible through the glaze. Adding these shadows on the lighthouse made it appear more rounded and lifelike. The darker shadows I added between the bottom of the lighthouse tower and the left side of the house changed the perception of the house, making it seem behind the tower rather than in front of it. I darkened some purple on the underside of this cloud and lightened the bright edge to provide some more contrast. To show more sunlight reflecting in the painting, I added highlights on top of the grass and water droplets and backlit this cliff edge closest to the sun. To add some life to the painting, I decided to paint some piper birds in the shallow water. I began by painting the white shape of each bird, then used a liner brush to add the legs, wings, and beak. For the reflection of each bird, I painted a darker, inverted shape of the bird and distorted the reflection by running a clean brush over it using gentle side-to-side -side motions. Once I added the birds, the amount of foam clumps gave a busy feeling to the area. So I erased a few of them in the same way I erased the rocks, rubbing them off with a Q-tip dipped in some paint thinner. I choose the color of my signature based on what will look right with the painting. I want it to be seen, but not distract from the painting. To sign, I use my liner brush with the paint thinned out to an ink-like consistency. I am eager to hear how this video helped you out. If it helps you with one of your paintings and you want to share a picture, I'd love to see it. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and suggestions are always welcome. If you haven't already, please subscribe so you don't miss my next video. Thank you all for your support. See you next time.